my name is Felicity Wren. Uh, I am the VP of Development for the ISA, the International Screenwriters Association. I am also the VP of Development for our production arm, Creative Screenwriter Productions. I have to say that um, this is a kind of like a, um, a confession time uh, that because I read a lot of scripts for work and we're around the industry quite a lot, sometimes when I want to relax, I don't read, I don't watch anything that's um, sensible. I watch cooking shows from the UK where um, you kind of watch someone create, it still feels artistic and creative, but you watch food, basically people making food. That's one of my favorite kind of um, secret pleasures to watch cooking shows. Um, and I think it's just because it's, you have something that you start and it comes from ingredients and you still get something you create at the end and it's very uh, visceral and it's real and it's there in front of you. However, of course, I do love movies and I do like watching them and uh, TV shows. Mm -hmm. The last movie that I watched that I really love was Past Lives and we watched that at Sundance. Um, we went to the festival with our table read my screenplay winner and uh, had a brilliant time doing a reading during the festival um, festival time, festival weeks. And we also got to see some movies and Past Lives was incredible. I would highly recommend that. So that's a favorite movie I've seen at the cinema recently. Um, and then uh, been things I'm watching, I love to watch French shows um, on TV. I know that might seem a weird thing, but actually it's it's kind of a way to also distract my brain from playing on my phone at the same time, because you have to read the subtitles. I am also learning French on Duolingo, but um, so, and also French TV shows have amazing, sexy older women in the lead roles. And I'm like, yes, please, more of that, um, because I really like watching these incredible women being given these really wonderful roles. And sometimes they're silly and funny, but um, so wants to recommend Astrid, uh, which is someone who is on the spectrum and she works in the um, the files at the police station and she's amazing at solving clues and she has a kind of a sidekick um, female who's the cop and she's kind of blousy and amazing and Astrid is all kind of um, kind of very rigid um, and it's it's a really wonderful uh, duo for the two of them. Candice Renoir is a mum with four children, a single mother with four children. She's amazing. She's also the commander, um, commander at um in this in the station and everyone fancies her and there's no why wouldn't you she's absolutely gorgeous um and the other thing i really love is tv shows where the detective tv shows where the lead character um has a, something wrong with them <laughs> as in like they have a, they have a, a flaw that's um that's kind of neurological and i don't mean i don't mean something wrong with them i mean they have a difference they have a a, a uniqueness a quirkiness things like monk um I really love them. There was a new one just come out recently where he's got a little dog that I can't remember the name of, but anyway, it's been renewed. And then Frasier, always a classic if you need some to make you feel soft and cuddly. And then Dead to Me, I love all these women, female shows in the UK, Dead to Me, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and Somebody Somewhere would be my TV recommends. Oh, and also I can't forget Better Things by Pamela Adlon. I had to write down her name. Um, and Celia Imery, um, because it's based on her real life and it's a show she wrote herself and that she produced and that she is in. And I really love Pamela Adlon. I think she's an incredible, incredible woman, um, inspiring. And uh, the show is a real love letter to being a woman, um, having children and having a mother that lives close by. British theatre directors who have moved into film. Sam is with things like American Beauty, 1917, Skyfall, Empire of the Light. And then Stephen Daldry, who did The Hours, which is always one of my favourite movies of all time. Um, and Billy Elliot and The Reader with Kate, uh, Katie, Kate Winslet. Just love that movie and extremely loud and incredibly close. So I kind of think they bring the visual elements uh, that I love from theatre in a way that tricks and uh, plays with imagery in um, in their movies. And I, that really, uh, I really am drawn to that and I admire it greatly. Um, writers, I was thinking about writers and I um, there are movies that I love and then Charlie Kaufman, you know, because he wrote Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And I really love Andrew Andrew Nichol, who did Gattaca, The Truman Show. Um, because I think, again, I like how they are questioning society, giving us a new view on something, um, leaving you with uh, things to think about when you finish watching the movie. Um, things that get under your skin. I guess I like writers that do stuff like that. I literally had a crossroad moment, um, which is um you always hope for that for your memoir right um but I was seven 
and I had a choice between ballet and drama. Um, and I've been doing ballet since I was two and a half, so I really loved it. And I just started doing drama. And my ballet teacher showed me that my second toe, my next to my big toe, is actually quite long. You know, not freakishly long, but maybe, okay, it's freakishly long. No, it's not. It's not that bad. But if I'd have been on point, it would have really kind of you know those terrible photos that you see people's feet in there. And so I was like, okay, drama it is. Um, so that was at seven. And from there, I think I've always loved storytelling. I really believe you can change people's mind. You can make people more compassionate. You can um, educate them without telling them off. And um, it's such a way of connecting people. Um, and I really do love being with friends and watching a good story or hearing a great story that is inspiring and makes me feel happy. Um, so I went and got a degree and um, then I went to get my degree after my start school stuff. Um, I did my degree in Yorkshire. So then I was like, no contacts in London for coming to the, being part of the business. So I just moved down to London with nowhere to live and no money. And I stayed, luckily in the end, a friend put me up on their couch and I used to hang around in the kitchen next to the coffee and kind of go like, so uh, a spare cup then? You know, it was kind of, I was really broke and, um, I didn't quite know how I was going to figure it out, but it, you know, when you're in your very early twenties, 21, you know, you think the world's amazing and everything's going to be fine. So you're going to find a way. So, but within a week I had found a way, someone that lived in the house that I was staying on the couch on worked at the box office at the Prince Edward theater. And I started there and I kind of started working in a mainstream big theater, um, selling tickets, that thing of youth of being proud and thinking that I was above selling tickets, but I had the best time there, made the best friends, and some of the most fun that people have in those box offices, just, you know, if you ever go to the theatre, is that they're watching everyone come in in their, in their finery. And from in the UK, they'd be coming in from Essex, which is where I come from originally, and in jumpers in, with, covered in peacocks with, made of sequins. And um, our, our mugs that said tea on them had vodka in them. And I moved away from London because I thought that I hated London, realised I hated myself, moved back, found a gentleman, got married. Um, like it sounds like I found him in the street. I didn't find him in the street. We were, um, he, I was working in a bar and he used to come and stare at me quite a lot. And then we became friends and then we started dating. Um, went back and got my masters. And then he wrote a play and we started a theater company. Um, so, and we have a little venue that will be 25 years of running this year, uh, next year, 2024, um, which was quite tough during the pandemic. Um, it's a little 54 seat black. Uh, black box and um there we could help artists too we could help we could help ourselves because he had written a play and I was acting in it I love creating somewhere where you can shine excel be your true self and um, make some mistakes that's the whole thing about writing performing all the arts is but there are no mistakes there's only feedback no failure only feedback so that and I was doing that all was fine I had some great friends and then I was like, you know what? I think there's something else that needs to happen. And what really needs to happen is LA needs a British actress who hasn't had any work done. So um, I moved to LA, I, I, I did the whole thing. I stuck things on my fridge, Brad Pitt, um, and that hasn't worked out. Um, uh, and then Lucky Felicity and some money and the Hollywood Hills. And within two years, I managed to get my uh, O-1 visa and saved up some money and got here. And that was 13 years ago. It's crazy how quickly it goes. And I love LA, but it, the time goes quickly because it's mainly one season of beauteousness. Um, but it is a different way to live because it's kinder, calmer. Um, there's more space, there's more room to breathe than London. I think big cities, which I still am madly in love with, by the way, I still love big cities. But there is a gentleness to LA that I really appreciate. Um, and the fact that it's you have the ocean and the mountains and all the screenwriters here, <laughs> all the businesses here. So. Um, there are some incredible writers that uh, have become friends uh, that I've met during my time in LA. Wouldn't it be amazing if we kind of knew that we, could, we were heading down a path and then we would get to the end of what's on the end of that path? It would be such an, uh, it would make life feel uh, more sensible, probably. And probably we really don't want that if we're, if we're honest about it. Um, there was a moment when... Uh, a playwright called Glyn Maxwell had written me three plays. He'd seen me in something and he'd written me three characters in three different plays. And one of them was going to perform in New York. I hesitated before saying yes to doing it. And the producer in New York got someone else. 
And I always kind of wondered if there are so many sliding doors moments. I know that's that's a that's a reference from a movie from 100 years ago, but I still think it's a great movie that has um, a lot to kind of a lot of fun things. Things are still working it very well. Um, but there are so many sliding doors moments in your life that you don't even realize the sliding doors moments where you go that way or that way. Um, and that's what makes it fun, right? Um, so yes, I don't think anything really worked out the way it did. I mean, I'm obviously not, act, I'm not the British Meryl Streep. I mean, I guess there's still time. She's in her seventies, um, but uh, I wouldn't have the career she had. But um, I think the thing is, it's being able to pivot um, and look for the happiness in life. So yes, I got here, realized that actually you really need to do a really amazing American accent to get hired um, here, even if even though they like Brits, they still mainly cast them as Americans. I listen to TV and I watch actors and I can hear their Britishness. I, you know, I can hear it in their, um, in their accents. And so I would never want to do that. And also when you get emotional, your true accent comes out. So I, you know, doing any kind of role that really meant that you were giving all, all of your all, I think my Essexness and my Londonness would come out. Um, so I pivoted. And the thing is, I'd always been working with scripts in the UK and working uh, with James, my ex-husband, uh, on his scripts. We would work together. And then other scripts that came to me, I would always be offering notes and working with the writers. And then I, even as an actor, um, performing, uh, if it was a, a new play, then we would also work with the writers as an actor. So I think I've always been playing with the uh, form of performance in different ways. Um, and so kind of moving to the uh, into the ISA and kind of working with screenwriters and working in development um, seemed like a natural fit for me because it was something I'd always been kind of doing anyway. Um, and we always say to screenwriters, if you want an education in screenwriting, read screenplays. And one thing actors do a lot is read. Um, sometimes um, terrible things that you then have to pretend are good. Uh, which was another reason why I think I wanted to um, take a break from performing and find other ways. I like—I'm too much of a control freak. I want to—I want to work with people I like on writing that I think is amazing. And if I'm going to be in it, I want to make sure that I think the role is incredible. Um, and so I do have a production company in the UK. I have a production company with my ex-husband, and I have been in some of those films because it met that criteria. But I guess it's just the fact is that I've always looked for things that made me happy. Uh, that has been an overriding idea and wish in my life. And for the people that I know, you know, um, that if you're doing something that you are happy to get up in the morning for, um, that the conversations that you have, it, I just think it allows you to live um, a happier life, of course, because you, your days are made up of the moments. Your life is made up of the moments in your days. Don't be afraid to look in the mirror and see how am I doing? Do I need to change something? Do I need to do something lovely for myself today? I got involved with the ISA kind of by chance. I mean, again, it's a sliding doors moment. Um, I was dating someone who I met my first week of moving to LA. So that was crazy. Um, and he was involved in a, in a movie. We went to see the movie. It had one of the most awkward sex scenes on a hospital metal bed that I have ever seen. And that his friend was the person having sex on that metal bed. It was one of the worst kind of moments I think I've ever I've ever seen. And then we had to meet everyone afterwards because um, you know we were friends with people that were in the movie. And one of the people that was also there was uh, Craig James Petroviak, the founder of the ISA, and um, he knew someone in the movie too. And um, we just started talking uh, generally about movies and um, and the business. And we just kind of had a nice chat and didn't think any more of it. Um, I don't know, cut to a week later, we we joined the gym so we could be fit and healthy, live a good LA. And there was a lovely, I think it was mainly we joined because there was a lovely jacuzzi that you could go in afterwards outside. And we were sat in that jacuzzi and up walks Craig, James Petroviak. And um, we're like, oh, have we met? You know, my one's face. But I guess because he's American and, and Misha and I, my boyfriend at the time, were both British people. We maybe kind of were more memorable. But anyway, we started chatting about Breaking Bad and how much we loved it and all the intricacies of um, of uh, the storytelling and the premonition and the the, the characters and the um contrast and the and the dialogue and I mean we just kind of like geeked out about it and he said well I'm going to Sundance got a table read would you like to be part of it found out we were actors um so we went and did the table read 
um, had the best time ever, met a really great writer called Jeff York. It was his piece. Um, and then while I was in the table read, I was like, I have a few ideas about how this um, could work <laughs> because I can never keep my nose out of anything and I may, can never keep my mouth shut. So um, cut to, I have a conversation with Craig about the table read and then I meet Molly, Molly Cash, who is the COO of um, the International Screenwriters Association. And she's wonderful. I mean, the company longer than I have, 10 years. And, um, and we had a chat about what I thought about screenwriting and screenwriters and what I thought, what they thought and what I thought I could bring to the ISA. And that was nine years ago. Suddenly I was thrown into this, this incredible organization that really cares about screenwriters. And um, because that's always been my trajectory, I've always cared about being with, working with people that actually give a shit. Sorry, I said shit. Um, and then I said it twice. Um, so, uh, to find people that actually the heart was incredibly in the right place, that it really was about creating a safe space for screenwriters. You know, Cray created the International Screenwriters Association as a website so you could go there to check stuff out because he had been ripped off himself. He wanted to find, create a, a website that you could go to and check out a contest, check out a mentor, um, get some advice on uh, ways to enter festivals, you know, just different things that would help you if you were starting out. And I really believe in that um, supportive environment, that inspiring environment. So I first started off doing, working 15 hours a week um, and doing the table read. Um, and then it kind of grew from there really. Um, so we now have a development slate uh, that uh, Max Tim, who is the director of education and I started together about eight years ago, um, where we find writers and it becomes an elevated tier of writers on the ISA site. Uh, we work with them um, to give them notes on their scripts if they need them on their pitch decks. Um, we uh, do recommendation letters for them. Uh, we are at the end of an email if you need to moan about someone or ask a bit of advice about something you don't know yet. We also have a development arm of the ISA called Creative Screenwriter Productions. I'm VP of development over there. That's meant that some of the writers we have found through the development slate and through the ISA site in general through the um, uh, success stories that you can post. Uh, there's also as a writer's showcase. We're always looking, I'm on the hunt. I'm trying to find writers all the time that I think are uh, talented, have a, uni a unique voice, um, want to work hard because I think that is the other thing. You have to find writers that are invested in themselves, that believe in themselves, that are willing to do the work. This is not a solo, no one, If even if you have a manager, they can't make your career for you. You make your career for yourself. They can open some doors and give you lots of more free work to do because that's mainly what happens when you get a manager. You have to do spec scripts. Um, and they can guide your career and they are amazing and it uh, it really helps you um, have kudos in the industry because everyone goes, okay, they've got a manager, they're repped. They must know something. They must be able to do something. Creative Screenwriter Productions, we do have an agent. Um, and we have been taking writers out to production companies with their projects. Um, and that is something that we are working to do in the future. I produced three shorts with help. No one ever does. No, there's no producer that's a solo producer. Molly helped me a lot during that time. Um, Shana, who is another executive who is a incredible writer and producer herself, was also on board. So um, we have a gang of people that work at the ISA and work together. Um, and And I think what we're doing now is providing um a service i now say that uh it's like a big giant tinder um in the best best of ways we spent two and a half years during covid meeting production companies managers agents and finding out their mandates and now the writers that we have found already and the writers we will find in the future we are connecting them we are um, being a conduit for talent to people who are looking for voices who are looking for diversity who are looking for that special something that they haven't already seen or isn't part of the normal group of writers that are being passed around by the top agencies um as you know they're they're incredible writers too but sometimes there's room for some others and that's what we provide we provide some others although some of our writers too are repped by very big agencies you know we have writers that are on our development slate that are repped by caa um it's a real mix but we also have some people that have just left school and are starting out and um, are finding their way. And anything we can do to help writers, because without writers, there is no business. The filmmaking industry is built on stories and ideas, and someone has to write them. 
And uh, those storytellers are very important. And I think they've always been given a bit of a hard deal. I think TV has changed it a bit. Becoming a showrunner as well has kind of allowed writers more um, uh, acclaim and, and uh, it, recognition. And they deserve that. They deserve that. So I love the fact that I get to be part of their journey too. We've got two writers that we set up with managers just recently. I love being part of that journey, their journey. Um, they never forget that we were we were part and we were we believed in them. And um, sometimes that's what just what you need at the beginning is someone to say, actually, you're really good. Um, you should pursue this and be brave, throw your hat in the ring. Um, and then you have to do it, but it's nice where someone believes in you. And I think the ISA, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for writers to believe in and to help them believe in themselves. But with the Fast Track Fellowship recently, um, it's a really great script called Offsiders. It's a writing duo. Um, it's about uh, soccer or football, depending on where you come from, and the trans experience during, uh, uh, around soccer. And one of the writers is trans. And um, it's a writing partnership that is fairly new, but it's, it's kind of like working out. They're really kind of getting it. And we could introduce them to a producer who loved the story and loved them immediately and then found the perfect other producer, other production company to um, to bring kind of the family together. And uh, that kind of magic um, is just something that is so heartwarming and so inspiring. And these writers, we had a call with them recently and um, one of them started crying because she was so grateful because she said, you know, I, you know, that they entered the contest late and it was just, it was a kind of last minute thing that felt they that, oh, they'd been working on this script and they thought it was kind of ready. And they, it was a last minute, oh, we should just, you know, let's put that in. And um, she just said her life has changed so much from, uh, from being part of the fellowship, from being one of the fellows. And, um, and then they had some questions about even the process of what's happening with the production and the filmmaking and and other things they're doing. And we gave her some advice and she was like, thank you. It's, it's, there's, I think it's just the fact that she felt that there's no one to ask, you know? And I love the fact that we can be someone that you can ask those questions to. And we'll do our best to answer them to the best of our ability. So I think that, I always love it as well when writers, um, we give notes to writers on a call and they go, you read it to the end? You know, like the the, Writers are so badly treated that they don't even think that you're going to get to the end of the script before you talk to them about it and give them notes. Um, and I'm that that softness, that 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 sweetness, I absolutely adore because I think there's a, a humility there and a humbleness. They they really don't need. They should be so proud of themselves. It's so hard to write. It's so hard to write and be and be good. And the only way to get better is to keep doing it. Um, but I guess the thing I would say is that uh, when I see a writer and I see them growing and I see them kind of getting faith in themselves and starting to believe and that we were part of that and we helped them on their journey, that absolutely, absolutely warms my heart. Um, and I think then they can write the story that they need to write. And I always say to my writers too, that I see you on the page. Um, there's this whole idea that we can, they're like, write what you know. But when they say write what you know, it's not, you know, I live in an apartment, I'm wearing a red dress, pinky red dress. You know, it's not that. It's 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 the worries you have about relationships because you've had your heart broken. It's it's um a difficult aunt that wore a big hat, you know what I mean? That um basically was the the black sheep of the family and what she did and how she was outrageous, but you loved her. You know, it's those kind of inspiring things that will turn up in other ways. It could be a war movie, it could be an action movie, it could be a comedy, it could be a romantic comedy, but you can use the essence of the things that are troubling you in your life or make you laugh or have been um kind of memorable pressure points in your life the moments that kind of you felt something it really affected you in some way someone shouted at you someone was sweet and gave you a gift that you weren't expecting use those in your writing because that authenticity that comes from you in those moments um one they'll be so genuine that and we can't help it we just we feel that when it's genuine um uh off the page and then two it just you can't get away from that that's the that's the gorgeousness of you and your voice, that's your voice. All those things you're worried about, all the things that you love, all the things that make you laugh are your voice and putting them into your work. I mean, very hard therapy. It's not easy therapy at all. It's the most difficult thing to do, but it is also a way 
for us to see you. And I think actually all humans want to be seen and they want to be heard um, because otherwise why are we here on the planet? Everyone has a voice in their head, you know? And sometimes that voice in your head is not always the nicest voice in your head. Um, and it tells you a story that maybe doesn't make you feel very good. But as soon as you realize that, that this is just a voice in the in your head and you are someone behind listening to that voice in the head, you can stop the voice in the head and reframe it. And I think that is something that you always need to do as a human living on the planet, but also just um, especially in a creative process um, when you are uh, giving yourself a hard time. This will never work out. This will never work out. I will never get this script finished. What if I did get this script finished? What if this does work out? Um, I'm a terrible writer. What if I'm a writer that's improving every time I write something. And that what if, that reframe is a way for you to stop beating yourself up. And maybe you can't go, I'm going to win an Oscar with this script. That might that might be too, although do say that to yourself as well, write it somewhere on a post-it note. But you can do it in increments. You know, I'm just going to write the best pages I can do today. And I know that I can write some good pages. I'm just going to write the best I can today with where I'm at. And it might only be one page and I might hate it tomorrow, but I'm going to do the best I can today with that one page rather than I need to finish this um, and all the kind of other uh, ways we beat ourselves up. Don't beat yourself up. It's already hard enough. There, you know, Life has its own challenges as is. Um, so I think try and be kind to yourself and do the reframe. What if it works out? What if it gets better? What if I'm really great at this? What if um, everyone loves my work? What if I find an incredible um, mentor that wants to work with me and thinks um, I'm wonderful? Um, and all those what ifs also might give you a bit of inspiration as to what you should do next. So if you go like, what if I had the most amazing mentor that had done what I want to do and I could bring them up at any time to ask, uh, well, I'd be respectful of their time, but I would, um, I could ask them a question if I was stuck. And you go, like, okay, so who would be my perfect mentor? And now you've got a little something to look for, to aim for. And now you think, okay, so who could I, how could I find them? Would they be working on this kind of show? Are they a producer? Are they another writer? So then you would find um, a project that maybe is like your writing, if it's going to be a writer. If it's a producer, maybe a project that's uh, been produced by someone that is uh, like your project. And you can go and try and find them. Go and try and find your people. Try to see if you can connect on social media. People love flattery. See if you can find an email. It's a weird thing about cold outreach. The to whom it may concern doesn't work. Definitely doesn't work. A really long email listing all your credits doesn't work. A short email that says something that praises the person in some way or has a comment on something that they've done recently um, that you have become aware of that is that they might be very proud of and you think is amazing and that you then say at, at the end and I would love to five minutes of your time at some point if you wouldn't mind if I could just ask a couple of questions because I'm so inspired by you an email like that might work I always say that um sometimes people email us at the ISA and um there might be a project or something that I'm kind of avoiding and if that email pops in I'm like it's still working if I'm reading that email so I think um You'd be surprised, I think, if you do your due diligence around the cold outreach, um, that they might work more than you think. And then there are lots of other ways. Well, get creative about how you can get in touch with someone. Um, I mean, send them a piece of post. Whoever gets, I never, I never have, I never get anything exciting in the mail anymore. I would love if someone sent me a card. Um, so I don't know. Find your own special way of getting your voice out there, and know that. Um, you can always get better and it's supposed to be fun and the, uh, enjoy the creative process because you are a creative person, not because it's a means to an end. The means to the end is that you love it and that you enjoy yourself and that you get to put your ideas out there and someone gets to read them and maybe one day we'll say them for you as an actor and they'll be filmed and on a screen and someone else will watch it and it might change their life. It might make them understand a problem. It might them make them understand a person that they didn't before that moment and you did that and if you affect one person how amazing how amazing and you got to you got to do that and that was you out in the world so do that <laughs>